Imagine trying to teach someone how to throw a perfect spiral without using a football to practice with, or learning how to fly solely by reading about it in a book. Having the physical object in front of you, or at least a physical model, can be critical to understanding how something works in the real world. But imagine if that object you're learning about is so complex or so intangible, like a nanostructure or a nanoparticle, that a physical model isn't possible. In this final episode, we'll learn how scientists at UC Merced are developing and using digital technology that helps us visualize, research, and learn about things we could previously only imagine. Since its introduction in cinema more than 50 years ago, the creators of three-dimensional imagery have been revolutionizing the way we see the world around us. While 3D technology has been primarily influenced by the motion picture and gaming industries, its use in scientific research has created a new way to approach the study of many fields. In materials science, which requires a fundamental understanding of tiny structures invisible to the naked eye, utilizing 3D digital technology as a modeling tool is becoming increasingly integral to the advancement of the field. So you can take a material like silica glass, uh, where a particular nanoscale shape wasn't flexible, or it was flexible only to a certain degree. If it's um, shaped like a helix or like a spring, it becomes much more flexible. And so that's really interesting. So if you identify this as an interesting material, you have to start characterizing um, how this material behaves and ways that you can sort of tune its performance and say, okay, if I make the, the spring thicker, then it'll behave in a certain predictable way. Then when they go and manufacture them and, and fabricate them, then they'll know in predictable ways how to make them to satisfy very specific constraints. Right now, there's a lot of applications and sensors for nanosprings biosensors. Also, they respond to uh, magnetic fields. Even non-magnetically sensitive materials in the nanospring shape are seeming to respond to magnetic fields, which is really interesting. That particular shape is just a, such an unusual shape that it's kind of opening up a bunch of avenues in, in terms of, of new and novel behaviors. On the simulation front, we want to add to that and sort of really, really expand that. So uh, today we're going to go over some of the applications of the 3D system. Material science professor Lillian Davila began her career using technology like this on a large scale at UC Davis, using powerful computer systems to track the geometry, positioning, and physical characteristics of each nanomaterial model. Calculating all this data was previously limited to the realm of supercomputers, or banks of computer processors, which, because of their size, are built in special facilities that are costly and inconvenient to use. When she arrived at UC Merced, Davila sought to create a low-cost system that could do much of the groundwork previously done by supercomputers. For a fraction of an average system that we could set up something like this, and so I started recruiting the, the right people to be able, with their technical skills, to be able to do that. We have a uh, modeling computer that is going to manage positions of atoms and generate a display, a tracking system which consists of three different infrared cameras which are following and tracking reflective spheres that are on a set of 3D goggles and also a Wiimote, which is used to control the system. Using this technology, the UC Merced researchers in Davila's lab are able to model nanostructures in three dimensions and interact with those models, essentially manipulating virtual atoms. Atoms will either repel each other or join together depending on how they're oriented, and the resulting structures will have a real-world behavior. It was exciting to be able to kind of build your own and then have it actually work very well in producing um, you know, results that uh, we can use in uh, new research. Right now we're already performing simulations in the system, so uh, a student or students could perform computer simulations now in the system and do data analysis on the virtual em uh, environment after the fact. When we get an accurate view, an accurate representation on the screen in, in 3D, we take this knowledge and now we can look at it and do an additional sanity check. Whereas before, all the analysis that we're doing is strictly empirical, which is great, but this adds a dimension that I think is really important. Almost, a, almost that experimentalist dimension, where you get to look and, and almost feel it. So a, that goes back to that real-world visual sort of interaction. 
While this 3D technology is enabling researchers to better understand nanomaterials and their physical properties, Davila is also using it to help undergraduate students grasp the most fundamental principles of these tiny structures. It's bringing me back to this idea where I can bring a feel for this material or, or what I'm working with and, and really gain a deeper understanding of what I'm doing. And so I think it Im improves my effectiveness as a researcher and it increases my ability to learn. It enhances our ability to do things in education and enhances our ability to understand things. Having already combined material science with computer science in a unique and effective way, Davila then sought to understand how the new technology could affect the ways in which students learn about nanomaterials. So she enlisted the help of cognitive scientists at UC Merced to gauge whether students were learning more effectively using the interactive 3D simulations than they would using textbooks or physical models. The result is an interdisciplinary research and educational project that is continually monitored its own success. As we've been finding, students learn much more effectively if they can have a hands-on experience. We find that what we're working with is very directly intuitive and they're able to absorb new concepts and take them further much more rapidly if they are able to have uh, kind of a direct hands-on interactive experience rather than just through trying to absorb things in the classroom through textbooks and audiovisual aids. This generation is the most technically savvy uh, and so uh, we debated, we did a, a very thorough exploration about what other tools might be there and what other people are using and we found that this was actually a very nice niche. And it's giving an opportunity also to foster collaborations with people outside material science. So it's not only computer science, cognitive science, and now we're reaching out to mechanical engineering and other fields. Eventually, this may grow into a lot more opportunities. My research in the past year and a half, I uh, validated the system, but it also showed that uh, the students' success depended on their training because it depended on motor actions and how well they were able to interact. So it wasn't good enough to just give them a good system that could present all these ideas and all these concepts. Uh, you had to train them well. And so my project this year uh, is creating these training manuals that will allow them to succeed in their usage. It's kind of my catchphrase is we're gonna teach them how to learn in order for them to succeed in the first place. The method that you use to train the students to use the system is actually very important. It's not just the tool, but it's how you present it and you uh, craft a, a, a laboratory ex experience, let's say, or, or an exercise that matters. So for me, that's, that's the area we are working on now. We're trying to find the best possible method that applies to most students in the class because the gadget itself is not the answer. Is how you apply it. These UC Merced researchers are breaking new ground in the use of 3D technology, both in the basic understanding and the advanced study of nanomaterials. And with their multidisciplinary approach to developing ways to incorporate technology into the classroom and lab, they see themselves as pioneers of sorts, paving the way for others to implement and expand on their advancements. I think that all of current electronic and computer technology is becoming cheaper and more powerful and more capable. Capable. And so whether it be from mobile devices to the 3D systems that we're working with, it's all going to become more accessible, which means that more innovative methods can be used within the classroom. The technology can be brought into the classroom. And I just think it's going to keep continuing in that direction. It's sort of really exciting to be able to work with 3D technology kind of at a research capacity. So it's kind of come full circle and I'm actually realizing what was a dream back then and actually being able to work in it to, and do research in it. The discovery of new knowledge is limited not by our thirst for it, but by the tools at our disposal, from examining our cultural past, to understanding our current behavior, to manipulating the building blocks that comprise our future. Those tools are advancing at an unprecedented rate. Digital technology is moving the cutting edge of academic research forward into exciting new realms, challenging our preconceptions of what is possible, and invigorating young imaginations to pursue answers to the world's most important questions in ways that were previously unimaginable.